Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching this special telecast with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. U.S. President Donald Trump was in India last week on a whirlwind visit, a visit which was high on optics and substance. There were several takeaways from the visit where a wide array of issues were discussed. It is in this backdrop that I would like to welcome on the program today Mr. Patrick Kilbright. He is the Senior Vice President of uh, the Global Innovation Policy Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. There, he oversees the center's domestic, multilateral and international programs and leads GIPC's policy work to promote intellectual property-driven innovation and creativity. Patrick, welcome to Rajasabha. Thank Television. you very much. It's great to be with you. So, let's start with the first and the most obvious question. What brings you here to India? You know, it's, it's a very timely visit following on the heels of uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Trump's meeting, and we're really excited about the bilateral relationship we have uh, two, the two major drivers of the global economy in the United States and India, at least in terms of democratic nations. And we think we have so much uh, in common in terms of uh, our values in the world, uh, how we'd like to see markets operate for everyone's benefit. And so it only makes sense that the U.S. and uh, India are, are collaborating. And with the, you know, seeing that, that collaboration going on at the most senior political levels, I think from a business community perspective, we know that we need to do our job too. Uh, and so, you know, I'm here meeting with uh, stakeholders in Indian industry to talk about what the future looks like for both our countries. You know, high level visits are one aspect of bilateral ties. How important is it for uh, follow up visits and also, you know, organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to follow up on these visits and also take the relationship forward. Well, that's right. Yeah, it's only uh, what comes out of these visits and, and what actually happens on the ground uh, that's important. And so that's where, uh, you know, my members come in at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We're the largest business federation in the, wor in the world, representing some three million businesses and business organizations. And uh, we, we clearly see that the keys to competitiveness in today's knowledge economy is in uh, mastering those intangible assets. Today, productivity is driven by knowledge and information and data flows. And so uh, the conversations that we're having are how do we put that into effect to make sure that we're getting the most out of our economies here in India as well as at home in the United States. And, you know, that's a conversation that's been ongoing for several years. I think it's reached a, a much better place today than it ever has been. But how big a problem do you think protectionism is, especially with U.S. President Donald Trump talking about, you know, making America, America first, and all these aspects? Yeah, you know, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, we don't like protectionism. Uh, we, we think that trade is an economic multiplier, so we want to see more of it. Nevertheless, we understand that here in India, at home in the United States, there are political imperatives uh, in terms of uh, domestic job creation. Uh, you know, and so I think from a business perspective, we understand that we need to be pragmatic. We need to point governments to the real uh, challenges and, and work together to make sure that we're uh, making the case against protectionism where we see it being counterproductive. Do you, do you believe that, you know, uh, we are going through a phase now where we are in a bit of, a tr a bit, 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 bit of trouble, really, as far as the world is concerned, because governments around the world are getting far, far, you know, far more protectionist? It's true. And, you know, we've seen this movie before. Uh, the world seems to go in some cycles when it comes to protectionism. And, uh, you know, we saw in the, in the 1930s the, the negative effects that, protectionism could have. I, I'm hoping that we're in a place to better manage that. You know, so much of the protectionism has tended to go towards some physical commodities. So part of my role is making sure that we don't translate that into obstacles to trade in the knowledge economy. I, I think if we can continue to uh, promote intellectual property standards, for instance, at a very high level, to help uh, policymakers understand how businesses invest in innovation and creativity, that we can isolate some of those, uh, you know, more trade negative effects of tariffs and, uh, and non-tariff barriers to those physical commodities and keep trade flowing in the information space. Since we're here, let's take it forward now. You know, this is your area of expertise. Yes, it Intellectual is. property and uh, uh, being creative and innovative, really, as far as uh, this is concerned. 
So tell us more about it and how, how, how does intellectual property drive innovation and creativity? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I, I think um, too often we take innovation for granted. You know, we, we live in a world that has changed so much and so quickly over, you know, the last couple hundred years, really, that we've come to say this is the natural state of things. But for thousands of years, human life really changed very little at all. It was very slow and incremental change. Um, and then it was really the advent of intellectual property laws and the Industrial Revolution that set in motion a huge trajectory of, of innovation that's changed our lives in every way in terms of our health care, our food availability, even climate, which we're continuing to deal with and that we need more innovation to deal with. But it's important that we understand how innovation happens, that it's not a one-off aha moment. Someone has a great idea and then the next thing you know, there's a product or a technology waiting to serve us. In fact, innovation is a process. Um, it begins with you know, basic knowledge, scientific research, academic research into the way things work in the, you know, at, at the very basic level. And then it requires further research and development, what we would call applied science, product development and testing, and commercialization itself is a huge obstacle too. And that's where we see countries and economies split in terms of their competitiveness and their ability to deliver innovation is in making that leap from that basic idea, that, that new scientific knowledge, and being able to translate that into a product that can actually reach people and help uh, better people's lives. Uh, and so part of our job is to help governments, you know, at home in the United States, here in India and around the world, to see that process in its full depth and breadth so that they can put uh, appropriate policies in place to facilitate it. At what level are India and the United States collaborating on IP? So I think uh, collaboration on IP has improved tremendously. Um, for years it, it languished a little bit, um, but under, uh, to give credit where it's due, uh, under the Modi administration since 2014, I think there's been a shift in mindset, um, and that was especially apparent after the 2016 national IPR policy came into effect that really said, India is going to set its future on, you know, the, the knowledge economy and made some very tangible uh, steps to, to put that into practice. So, you know, you've seen the Indian government investing in education, uh, in the school system on intellectual property. You've seen uh, uh, awareness raising with entrepreneurs. You've seen cross-government uh, enforcement efforts to protect, you know, India's investment in Bollywood and technology and so many other areas pharmaceuticals, for instance, and, um, and you've seen just a shift in the rhetoric, whereas pre-2014, the uh, sense you got from India was, we consume intellectual property, we don't produce it, and we're going to set up our laws to make it as cheap as possible. Well, today, you know, the mindset is, we are innovators, we are creators, we're making in India making for India, but also delivering to the world. And that's a different mindset, and it requires a different orientation on intellectual property, one that says we're going to help our domestic entrepreneurs invest in innovation and creativity here at home. On the other side of the spectrum, you have piracy. How big a problem is that? So piracy is a global problem, and, you know, two, two sort of aspects to that. One is sort of counterfeits of physical goods, which in an e-commerce world is extremely dangerous. You know, when you go online and you, you buy something on a major e-commerce platform, you expect to get what you paid for. But too often what you're seeing is you're, you're getting something that is either a knockoff of an established brand or something that looks like it but not quite and may have tremendous uh, health and safety concerns. You know, we worry about lead paint, we worry about asbestos, we worry about chargers that could catch fire and blow up. You know, these are very real dangers in today's economy. Um, the other side of that is, is piracy, digital piracy. And, you know, when we, you know, when we don't use legitimate channels to access things like movies and music and television, we risk exposing ourselves to malware, to identity theft, to, uh, you know, to outright financial theft. Uh, and so it's, it's really critical that governments address this problem since it is sort of a new issue for all of us. We're all dealing with these emerging technologies. 
It's a great area for collaboration. This is not, you know, the United States demanding things of India. This is all of us working together to try to figure it out. So how do we address this problem? I mean, is there a short-term solution to it? What do we need to do in the short term and maybe in the long term as well? Yeah, so I, I think information sharing is absolutely critical. You know, on the uh, counterfeit product side, we see that when governments are willing to share information with businesses in real time, that you can actually identify the bad actors, uh, isolate them, and, and, and make sure that they don't operate with impunity. So that, that's the first thing. You have to have a deterrent level of enforcement within the economy so that there's not uh, this incentive for, for uh, bad behavior. And what we've seen is that the, the entities that are involved in counterfeiting and piracy and drug smuggling and even human trafficking all tend to be the same set of uh, transnational criminal networks. Um, and so it's important that we don't take these problems in isolation, but we see them for what they are, which is, you know, sort of a source of funding for transnational crime, even in some cases terrorism. Uh, and, you know, and so we have to be eyes wide open. We have to be very strategic about how we approach these issues as, uh, you know, from both a public and a private sector perspective. Let's take the discussion forward now and talk about another aspect. You spoke about scientific research, you mm -hmm. spoke about uh, patents and so on and so forth. You know, as far as uh, uh, China is concerned, agreed that the American uh, establishment is concerned about the strategic side of it. But if you look at the industry, at some level, is the industry also concerned about what China has done and its potential really for the future because the number of AI patents that were filed by China for the first time in history surpassed the United States in 2019. So is that a concern? The industry, I think, uh, global, and I'll say global industry here, although I you know, speak specifically for the, for the U.S. business community, but I think industry is very conflicted with China. On the one hand, it's been such a source of rapid growth for the last two decades that it's been a market that no one could afford to stay away from. You know, if your competitor is growing many times faster than you because they're serving the Chinese market, they're going to be able to outperform you in every other market. So industries really had no choice but to play in that market despite all of the risks that have been apparent in terms of intellectual property theft, of course technology transfer, you know, tariff and non-tariff barriers. There's been a whole host of ways that the Chinese government uh, has tended to intervene in markets and even when they have the right rules in place, you know, we've seen that China has a way of keeping its thumb on the scales. So that's, that's the downside. The upside is that growth and the, the reality that you can't ignore that uh, as, a, as players in a global economy, you have to play where the action is. Fortunately, I think we've seen here in India more rapid growth as well, although it has slowed somewhat. But the, the long-term trajectory is, is clear that, that this has been a growth environment. And that's really important to have that balance in the global economy. So by the same token, I, I think we feel keenly that the United States has to continue to play a role as a driver in the global economy. So we want to make sure that our economy is hitting on all cylinders as well. Otherwise, we're really forcing our companies to go and invest more in China. Um, so, you know, when we, we talked about the protectionism, for instance, it all circles back, you know, if we're, if we're going to take measures that slow growth in our own economies, then we're forcing our businesses to go to China. You know, uh, another aspect, you spoke about collaboration, you spoke about how India and the United States really have a great opportunity as far as IP is concerned. You know, you also spoke about scientific research, but at what level are we going to see technology being exchanged? At what level are companies willing to share the kind of cutting edge technology that they have? So, you know, this year, uh, we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the U.S. by Dole Act. Uh, in 1980, um, Senator Bob Dole and Senator uh, Birch Bayh came together you know, in a bipartisan fashion to craft this uh, legislation that would allow uh, government to fund research at a very basic level, for instance, at universities or federal labs, but then have the ability to assign the rights to their discoveries to, to others, you know, often startups or then later larger businesses that can take it and turn it into a real product. 
that has been a game changer for the United States. And I think what we see today is India is at the moment where it needs a Baidol type, type uh, of mechanism to help translate the tremendous uh, scientific research that's taking place in universities across the country, to turn it into real products that are addressing uh, problems that Indian people face today. Okay, let's widen the scope of the discussion now and move on from IP and talk about trade sure. and commerce as a whole. At what level do you see India and the United States collaborating on trade and commerce? So let's be candid. I think uh, collaboration in global trade has been poor in the past, but we're, we're in a different place now. India is not the country that it was 20 years ago. The United States isn't either. We talked about China. So clearly the imperative is there. I think we need to, uh, from a business community perspective, challenge our leaders to step up and to be leaders in the global economy. Uh, the World Trade Organization has languished in the last uh, 10 years. You, you've seen uh, that organization that once drove multilateral talks sort of become a little bit defunct. Uh, I, I think uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Trump can come together and uh, try to re-energize that organization as a vehicle for, uh, for, for global trade negotiations. I think it's important for our leaders to be ambitious. Um, this is not the time for uh, retreating to isolationism. You know, it's okay to be nationalist. It's okay to be patriotic. We all, you know, we want to, if you're the Indian prime minister, India needs to come first. If you're the American president, America needs to come first. But you also need to have that bigger strategic vision of how we can work together to drive the global economy. That requires some attention to uh, trade flows, to setting the, the right example for, for emerging markets around the world, and helping to set the tone, the political tone, and the uh, economic reality for the next era of global growth. If there is one sticking point uh, between the relationship between India and the United States, it's probably trade, because you know we've reached new heights as far as our bilateral ties are concerned, but trade still is the thorn in the flesh. How do we address that particular issue? And do you see that being addressed anytime in the near future? I think what's happened is that trade negotiations have become much more pragmatic under the leadership of uh, President Trump and Prime Minister Modi. They're very focused on specific industries, specific outputs, and that's okay. You know, um, for, for many years uh, after World War II, we saw a much broader, more comprehensive approach to, to trade negotiations um, that really helped to lower tariff and non-tariff barriers around the world. Today, we're, we're back in that uh, more mercantile mindset. I, that's okay for a while. We can let them do that and, and say we're going to advance certain industries and, and you're going to advance certain industries and we'll work together to make that happen. But then we've got to return to that strategic vision, uh, you, you can't get lost in that mercantile mindset for too long. Till that time, uh, where we see an FTA or some forward movement really on the trade front, how do we take things up a notch? So we've seen great cooperation in defense and energy. We, we desperately need collaboration on climate change. You know, and this is an opportunity. I, I, there was a great... Uh, uh, editorial piece in the Economic Times today by uh, T.K. Arun that said, hey, coronavirus is a huge threat, but it's also an opportunity for India. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it's one that could sort of capture some of the issues that we've been talking about for a number of years here, which is that in order to facilitate in innovation, we need to be able to provide businesses with the confidence to invest. So we need to look at our, our laws, look at our political rhetoric, make sure that it's supportive of risk-taking and investment. And especially with something like coronavirus, you want to make sure that you can get something to the market as quickly as possible to help serve people today, but also that you're facilitating ongoing innovation so that it's not just that one-off moment that, okay, we've got this coronavirus vaccine, now we're done. No, you know, you're going to want to make it better. You're going to make it safer and more effective, find different ways to deliver it to patients. And that's the kind of incremental innovation that um, we haven't seen uh, facilitated by Indian law. I think one of the opportunities that I'm here to talk about is how we set the stage for India to be a bigger player in 
the continuing innovation cycle uh, in pharmaceutical and other sectors. My final two questions to you before mm -hmm. I let you go. Uh, what are the new avenues that you foresee uh, that are going to come up in the near future as far as India and the United States are concerned? So, uh, first of all, I think uh, we, we need to be thinking strategically about geopolitics, about China, but also about the rest of the world, how uh, we, we can help to secure the uh, trust and confidence of the world in the democratic form of governance. Um, you know, I think as, uh, as two nations who believe in the importance and the value of the individual, that we have a common commitment to lift all people up, not to, uh, you know, see the political elites uh, making decisions that affect billions of others, but actually empowering individuals to be drivers of change in their own lives and in, in their economies and, and society. So that's, that's one. I think, uh, two, to understand that global trade is, uh, is an advantage, a force multiplier in our economies to, you know, as we discussed, not to get too lost in promoting one industry or another, but to, to look more broadly and really be strategic. And, and so that's my challenge to both leaders is don't, don't be shy, you know, be ambitious and, and let's work together to really make this uh, and a one, better place. And one final comment, a quick comment, Patrick, mm -hmm. before I let you go. Any uh, word for the Indian industry and the authorities? You know, the future is bright. We're, we're betting on India and uh, we've been here for the long term. We're going to stay here for the long term. Okay. All right. Patrick Kilbright, a pleasure having you on the Thank program. Thank you very much, Thank Frank. you so much for being yeah, here on Broadcast be on you. Television. Well, that's it on the special telecast. See you again next time.